I feel strongly that the future will belong to individuals and organizations that can collaborate across traditional boundaries to shine a light into new corners of our world. And it's a spirit of global cooperation and global vision that will guide the future of media. I believe that PBS and RT have a lot in common. We are both strongly focused on our service to children and are committed to providing quality content for all ages that educates, engages, and inspires our audiences. We're also both dedicated to sharing the history and culture of our respective countries. And with these shared missions, it's clear that working together, we can achieve a great deal in serving our countries. As technology continues to shrink the globe, it's the spirit of collaboration that will guide our steps forward. And Throughout the world, public broadcasters are facing many of the same challenges. I looked at some of the speeches that Noel has made recently, and to be honest, I could have taken those and delivered them myself in the United States. We all live in a fundamentally different world than existed when public broadcasting was born. Eric Schmidt, the former CEO of Google, has estimated that humans now create as much information in two days as we did from the appearance of Homo sapiens until 2003. Facebook, which did not exist until 2003, now reaches more people than all major media outlets combined. There are countless satellite television channels operating up countless variations of commercial programming, and there's an increased reliance on the internet for entertainment. Media consumption is up, but the percentage of young people consuming news is down. In the United States between 2006 and 2009, daily newspapers cut their annual editorial spending by $1.6 billion, which represented a quarter of their estimated spending. Television news staffs have declined by half from the late 80s in the United States. And in the United States, in 2001 to 2002, re reality television accounted for about 22% of the primetime audience. By 2011, it accounted for about 56% of all television produced. 56% are so-called reality shows. Funding for public broadcasting is also at risk or in the process of being cut for many of us across the world. Public broadcasting in the United States has always been a public and private partnership. And the single largest source of revenue for public television in my country is actually individual philanthropy, people who support their local stations through membership contributions. The federal government in the United States contributes about 15% of our system's revenue. That's 1-5%. And for every dollar in federal funding that is invested in our stations, they must go out and raise another six on their own, which includes contributions from literally millions of people who voluntarily support their community-based work. I just did an interview with Matt Cooper, and he was stunned that people would actually voluntarily write a check to a public television station and offer their support. But in fact, in my country, that's the way it works. But I think especially in this difficult economy, what has most concerned us is the potential loss of the vital seed money represented by the public investment in public broadcasting. This is the debate that presidential candidate Mitt Romney triggered by his comments in the first presidential debate. And we pointed out to him that this kind of cut would have a devastating effect and would be mostly felt by rural stations who were very reliant on the federal appropriation to fund their operations. As many of you know, it became a most serious threat. And in fact, this part of the presidential debate was, in my mind, the most serious threat in my memory to federal funding. Um, the comments that were made by uh, presidential candidate Romney and others is that public broadcasting was a luxury that America could not afford. But I am standing here today in part because the American people said no. Opinion makers, celebrities, champions in our legislature, but most important, ordinarily, um, ordinary Americans stood with us to declare that the media experiences we provide are in fact an essential part of our democracy. So while we survived this round, we know that it's not the end of it. And many public broadcasters that I talk to that are operating in different parts of the world are facing similar situations. Just look at what has just taken place in Greece. In the face of this new landscape, the challenge to public media around the world is this. Can we recreate ourselves for the digital age? 
and use media to help everyone from every age and every walk of life reach their full potential, because that is, in fact, what public media aspires to do. Can we help our countries come together and find the common ground that is so essential to solving our greatest problems? Can we rise to the occasion, even in this time of limited resources, and empower every citizen to be more? That's, in fact, the PBS logo, to be more. In fact, can we all be more? I think we can. In fact, I know we can. But if we're to meet this challenge, we have to think anew about what it means to be public media. Now, around the globe, we have to summon the courage to let go of old conventions and traditions and embrace, embrace new strategies, new methods, new approaches. See, I sound just like Noel, I know. <laughs> At PBS, we've been working on this challenge for the last few years, and we've learned a few lessons. Jim Collins is the author of the business books Good to Great and Great by Choice, and he's written extensively about what separates good companies from great companies. And he says one of the most crucial components of great companies is a clear sense of mission. To be successful, an organization must identify its core values as well as focus on what it can do better than any other organization on the planet. So with Jim Collins' advice in mind, we went back to find our sort of our corporate DNA, the one thing that separates us from everyone else in the world. Our mission, our core, is to use the power of media to help educate, engage, and inspire citizens and citizenship. We realized that we had to implement bold changes across all of our services and programs to ensure that we were, in ensure that we were fulfilling our mission by educating the next generation of citizens, engaging with new citizens and new audiences on different platforms, and inspiring newer, new community conversations. We started with our work for our very youngest citizens to make sure that we were educating today's kids to meet tomorrow's challenges. Now, when I joined PBS as CEO in 2006, our kids' programming was facing some real challenges. In the days since we had literally invented the genre with a little program called Sesame Street, we'd lost our distinctive sense of purpose. Now, in the 1970s and 1980s, when both Sesame Street and Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood were first on the air, there were really very few children's educational television shows. But over the years, those programs had lost some of their edge. We realized we had to do something bold to reclaim our position in this sphere. So we went back to our core values. We were created as an educational network, and we realized we had to put education at the forefront of our work for children. Our first step was to tie our programs to core curriculum to make sure that kids were actually learning applicable skills from watching our content. But we also had to do something more. One of the things I remember most about my nieces and nephews was when they were little, they asked incessant questions. Why don't dinosaurs still exist? Why is the sky blue? And when we looked at our children's programming, we realized that more than anything else, we had to nurture that innate sense of curiosity to turn the kind of questioning and exploration into skills that would help kids become active, engaged citizens. Because as much as we wanted to teach kids basic skills like literacy and math, even more importantly, we wanted to set them up for a lifetime of exploration. So we created new programming focused on bringing back the joy of learning while still teaching real measurable skills based on core curriculum standards. Each show was developed to give kids what they will need to be successful when they enter school. Our children's programming mostly focuses on early childhood. We asked, shouldn't the characters we develop and the stories we tell prepare kids to confront the kinds of questions and problems and challenges we know every child will come across at some point or another? Here's why I think it matters. There's a growing body of research that suggests that kids need to learn how to deal with these challenges at a very early age. Um, some of the experts call it developing grit, knowing how to handle adversity, how to be resilient, and how to be independent. Harvard Center on the Developing Child released a report that says the kind of social emotional skills um, that define grit are actually hardwired into our brains as young children. And when children don't learn how to deal with um, issues like patience or perseverance, actual thinking can be impaired. And certainly it limits their ability to learn and to pay attention in the classroom. 
Now, years ago, Fred Rogers developed a whole philosophy, and he built it into his children's series, Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. The whole idea that social emotional skills are the foundation for the success in school, and then, of course, in life. And so the growing body of research that has emerged since what uh, Mr. Rogers began his work has really confirmed what he, in fact, knew all along, that some of these skills are the most important predictors of success. So we decided we had to refresh his lessons for the next generation. Now, working with the Fred Rogers Company, we created Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Now, I don't believe we've yet offered this program up uh, outside of the United States. This is not a pitch, by the way. But I thought I would show you just a very short clip. I'm going to show you a lot of TV tonight, so I hope you're interested in that. I assume you are since you're in this room. But I'll show you a very quick clip from Daniel Tiger, and you'll get a sense of what I'm talking about. Roll the first clip, please. When you feel so mad that you want to roar, take a deep breath and count to four. One, two, three, four. So as you see, Daniel teaches kids, and I would argue parents too, how to deal with feelings like anger. And we use catchy songs and fun stories. And we see these themes uh, that re-emerge again and again in the same episode. I won't play more of this because those songs get in your head and they will not go out. Um, we're expanding, expanding this pro uh, um, on problem solving and resilience to areas like math and science. In the fall, we're launching a new kid show called Peg Plus Cat, which will focus on teaching problem solving skills, especially around math. I'm going to show you another clip, and I am going to apologize in advance because this catchy tune is going to stay for you for days, I promise you. Please roll the tape. You can have a perfect picnic with the pig. When little goes with little. And big with big. You can have a pear and apple plumber fig. When little goes with little. I'm well, well, well. You can wear a giant hat or little beanie. When big goes with big. And teeny goes with teeny. Let's all do a wild and crazy jig. If your little go with little and big with big. It makes me really jolly when I open my eyes and see everyone with something that is just the right size. A shake a shake a do. Rocky Skywalker. So that's our perfect picnic with the cat and friends. And pig. Wow. When little goes with little and big with big. <laughs> So I promise I won't show you any more children's programs. But um, I have to believe this is going to be a very successful uh, series for us, not only because it teaches great math skills. As you notice, the lead character is a girl. We are very interested in empowering girls to embrace both math and science as course areas that they can develop and become expert in. But with dancing chickens and an opera singing pig, you are destined for success, I think. We're trying to give kids the courage to ask questions, to try things, to fail, to get up, and try again. Characters on the TV screen can teach kids a lot of things, but computers, portable touchscreens, and console games also offer more ways to engage and motivate children. We all know kids love playing games. That's why you can't get them to stop playing with all those shiny new digital devices. But did you know that games are great at teaching resiliency? The only way you learn a new skill is by trying something and failing. Game, games offer kids safe spaces where they're encouraged to risk failure and learn from their mistakes. But we're not done yet. We're experimenting with all sorts of new ways to help uh, teach kids these important skills and inspire their imaginations. In the last few months, we've experimented with virtual reality, augmented reality, 3D, 3D rendered experiences, gesture-based navigation, and voice-controlled play. 
We're also experimenting with open-ended games and games that give kids creative control to tweak the games themselves. Now, not all of these ideas are gonna be perfect learning tools, but just as we're teaching kids, we're also learning from our experience, experiments. And we'll keep trying new concepts until we've figured out how to harness the power of new media to inspire the next generation. You see, public broadcasting always has been innovative in its work, and I know that's another thing that both uh, PBS and RTE share. Uh, we've always been innovators, not only in the content we produce, but in the technologies and the platforms. And when I look at our kids' work, I think it is an excellent story of how new technology has helped us to fulfill our mission and how we've been able to revitalize classic kids' programs to meet the needs of today's kids. We are, in fact, the top destination for children's programming online and over the air in May. PBSKids.org was the number one kids' site for total videos viewed for the 17th consecutive month. We also have five of the top 10, 10 kids' programs on television. And we compete against organizations with very deep pockets. I think it's because we're creating content that is important, that's engaging and fun, but also has core value. But of course, we're a lot more than just a children's television channel. If we're going to truly fulfill our mission, we can't stop when a kid enters uh, kindergarten. Our mission is to help every American be more with content that inspires us all to explore. So we have turned a critical eye to our work for adults to make sure that we are engaging people of all ages with our content. Now, one of the main problems was um, our challenges with our use of the web. We were actually very early on in using the web as a, as a means for distributing our content, but it was not as important as, as a distribution tool. So to build on Jim Collins' idea, we realized that the web, in fact, did offer us a chance to build on what we do best, which is curating information and providing a trusted window to the world. First, we had to make sure that our content was interesting and relevant, and it met the needs of viewers who had grown accustomed to shorter, more faster-paced content online. Like many others, in 2006, we were mostly just putting up content that we had derived from programming we created for the air, and just using these new platforms to disseminate it. And by the way, some of the early work we did was largely in text form. Not only was this outdated and not a good use of the unique qualities of the online space, but we were also missing a crucial audience who were increasingly turning online and to other screens for content. So we decided we had to rethink our strategy and put in place a new culture starting with web-only material that let our new work filter outward. We empowered our interactive division to develop new work and initially gave them the opportunity to work apart from the rest of PBS, but still focused on our central mission, interesting, entertaining, informative content. We encouraged them to try new things. Actually, our digital team members were encouraged to fail. In fact, failure is one of their performance metrics because if you aren't failing, you aren't stretching. Of course, because of the economics of the web, it's a lot easier to stomach failure there than with a big television program. And we certainly had some missteps early on as we struggled to find our footing. Some of our producers came back uh, with initial ideas that looked just like their broadcast work, except they were gonna put it online. They thought that's what we wanted. Other projects just somehow missed the mark, but slowly we found our way by focusing on content that was unique, that took advantage of the online's um, unique characteristics, and under the PBS Digital Studios banner, we've had some early success. Let me show you a clip. Hi, neighbor. Welcome again to this neighborhood. Did you ever grow anything in the garden of your mind? You can grow ideas in the garden of your mind. It's good to be curious about many things. You can think about things and make believe. All you have to do is think and they'll grow. Here's an idea. Here's an idea. Here's an idea. Super Mario Brothers is the world's greatest piece of surrealist art. It's a means of expression of how much they care about these things. All artists need to be creative and music needs to evolve. It needs to be relevant to people. We're in the dusty streets of Goma, Democratic Republic of the Congo. We're building a beat making lab at Yole, Africa. It's great to be a comedian living here. 
perfectionism is very dangerous because, of course, if your fidelity to perfectionism is too high, you never do anything. My invention was the screw-in coffin. Definitely, it's not for everyone. I'm Aaron Franklin, fire maker and barbecue cooker here in Austin, Texas. People ask me all the time, how do you make barbecue? What's the secret of barbecue? Well, finally, we're trying to team up with KLRU to teach people how to actually make real barbecue. Hey, I'm Patrick. Hey, I'm Steven. We're the National Film Society. PBS Online Film Festival. Have you ever wondered how successful human beings are as a species? You know that inflatable kid toy? How do they manage to always come back up? The entire Earth is rumbling, makes your whole body vibrate. The most intense thing I've ever done in my life. My name is Mike Wilson. Call me Coleman Eddie. I'm here to teach you stuff. In 1080p, museum educator for like a million years. Science explanation is crystal clear. Guaranteed that you'll upgrade your brain here. So in total, our PBS Idea Channel videos have been viewed nearly 12 million times. And you saw the uh, graphic with five Webby Awards. We were second only to Google in the number of Webbies awarded this past year. The Webbies, as you know, is the web version of the Emmys. Um, and so with numbers like that, it was only a matter of time before others in our organization began to take notice and to get on board. Many of our producers had also begun experimenting with content developed specifically for new platforms. Our science, news, and public affairs programs have all embraced the online space with great results. And of course, can people continue to come to pbs.org to find their favorite documentary film or to catch up on the last episode of Downton Abbey. Actually, uh, thanks in part to Downton Abbey for the fifth month in a row, pbs.org was the most popular network TV website in the United States, according to Comscore. Um, and that is, um, is pretty significant when you consider the investment that other broad broadcast networks in the U.S. make. It's pretty stiff competition. And so um, our online views have grown from a couple million videos a month to uh, 230, million video, 230 million videos a month. Um, along the way, we've seen some uh, really great ideas born, new models of programming which straddle the divide between our on-air and our online capabilities. But perhaps nothing exemplifies our digital evolution better than our Makers Project, which combines the power of television and the internet to document the last 50 years of the women's movement. The Makers Project started when uh, a very talented filmmaker by the name of Dylan McGee went to American feminist icon Gloria Steinem with the hope of doing a film on her life. Gloria politely rejected Dylan and said there was actually a much bigger story, a collective story that had never been told. And indeed, in researching it, Dylan found that no one had ever done the story of the women's movement in the United States writ large on camera. Now the entire history of the women's movement would take up a lot of time, even more than the three hours in prime time that we devoted to the documentary. And so Dylan designed a project that would harness the power of both our broadcast audience and internet platforms. Through an extraordinary partnership that we forged with AOL, a year ago, 100 interviews with groundbreaking women of all blocks of life, walks of life were put online in short two to three minute video segments. I'm gonna share with you one of my favorites. This is a, a, a little long clip, but I think it captures the film in a beautiful way, and I'll tell you a little bit of the context to this after you look at the film. Please roll the clip. A record field of 601 starters, brave chilly winds and a steady drizzle in the 71st Boston Marathon. The, the 1967 Boston Marathon was run in some of the worst conditions in race history. While most of the crowd was focused on the front of the pack, another runner was making a stir far behind. 
the idea of running long distance was always considered very questionable for women because, you know, an arduous activity would, would mean that you're going to get big legs and grow a mustache and hair on your chest and your uterus was going to fall out. In 1967, Catherine Switzer was a junior at Syracuse University. Because Syracuse had no women's track team, she began training with the manager of the men's team, a part-time mailman named Arnie Briggs. It was Arnie who told me about the greatest day in his life every year, which was the Boston Marathon. And we were out running, and Arnie began telling me another Boston Marathon story. And I said, oh, Arnie, let's just quit talking about the darn marathon and run it. And my dream then became to prove that I could run 26 miles, 385 yards. For 70 years, the Boston Marathon had excluded women. But Switzer entered using just her initials. We walked to the start, and the gun went off, and down the street we went. So there we were, Arnie Briggs, the 50-year-old mailman, and me, the 20-year-old college student, and my boyfriend, Tom Miller, the ex-All-American football player. When other runners would come by, they would say, oh, it's a girl, and they were so excited. And all of a sudden, the press truck is in front of us, and they're taking you know, pictures of us. On this truck was the race director, the feisty guy by the name of Jock Semple. He just stopped the bus, jumped off, and ran after me. And he just grabbed me and screamed at me, get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers. He had the fiercest face of any guy I'd ever seen. And all of a sudden, Big Tom, my boyfriend, came with a streak and gave Jock the most incredible crossbody block and sent Jock flying right through the air and landed on the curb. And all of this happened in front of the press truck. The journalist got very aggressive. What are you trying to prove? You know, are you a suffragette? Are you a crusader? Whatever that is, you know? And I said, what? I'm just trying to run. Then it got very quiet. Snow's coming down. Nobody's saying anything. And I turned to Arnie, and I said, Arnie, I'm going to finish this race on my hands and my knees if I have to. If I don't finish this race, then everybody's going to believe women can't do it. I've got to finish this race. I finished that race in four hours, 20 minutes. It wasn't until we stopped on the throughway to get an ice cream and some coffee that we see the newspapers and the coverage front and back of all the different editions with the pictures. I realized that now this was very, very important and this is, was going to change my life and it was probably going to change women's sports. There is an expression in a marathon that you do go through sort of a lifetime of experience. And I often say that I started the Boston Marathon as a girl, and I finished the Boston Marathon as a grown woman. This clip was originally done for the web, but it ended up being incorporated into the larger documentary. In fact, that's how the larger documentary uh, began. Uh, the broadcast reached nearly 4 million people in its original airing, with even more tuning in during subsequent showings of the documentary. But it also sparked a vigorous online conversation. During the initial broadcast alone, nearly 40,000 tweets with the hashtag makers were shared, with over 20,000 retweets and over 100 million total potential impressions. In fact, if you, um, if you follow the makers hashtag, you will see that that conversation continues on as we continue to build the online uh, biographies that our stations across the country are adding in. We didn't just rely on our airwaves to share the important story with the public. AOL then did a national search for next makers, and our public television stations are now committed that over the course of the next few years, they will identify local women who have shaped their communities in meaningful ways, and these stories are being recorded and placed on local station websites as well, websites as, well as being put in our national archives. Uh, working with our station in Washington, D.C. and AOL, PBS is providing comprehensive content for educators centered on the key themes of makers, and these materials reach 30,000 high schools and will also continue to live online as a resource for both teachers as well as the public. 
Makers is so important because it goes to the heart of our mission to engage individuals within a larger community. We do our work in order to inspire conversations within communities and to help encourage a vibrant democracy, but in order to keep ourselves relevant, we had to rethink our service to communities beginning with the very definition of community. Previously, our vision for communities was local and was, was rooted in a geographic place. And while I believe this is vitally important to our mission, we realized we also had to pay attention to new communities of shared interest, which we could reach using the enormous power of new media. Now, one of the most powerful ways to do this, of course, is using social media. And in order to truly fulfill our mission, we needed to embrace the possibilities of platforms like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube and GetGlue. From the beginning, we recognized that our social media team had to be nimble. We couldn't have our communications on these platforms going through layers of bureaucracy. We empowered our team to represent um, us in the social sphere, trusting that by engaging in the conversations of the day, we can help create larger conversations about our work in this space. We try our best to be truly interactive, to point out things we think our followers might find interesting, even if it's not PBS content and most importantly, to have a sense of humor. Now, see, we don't do as well as you do. I know you have a great sense of humor. In public broadcasting in the States, we struggle. Um, but we identified some other, actually, corporate organizations that we thought that were doing great work in this space. There are companies that have really taken to heart the work in social media, and we looked at other media organizations, including American Cable, for inspiration of how to create conversations. Of course, we could only hope to capture some of the same momentum that people with deeper pockets have in social media. You know, there are marketing departments that have their whole social media budgets that are, I think, larger than our entire content budget. Uh, but we look at the ways that we can advance our work in social media. And in fact, our social media team is literally two people. Actually, to be really honest, I've exaggerated that by a bit. It's really a person and a half. And I, have to, and I don't mean to brag, but they really have had great results, including if you were um, watching the Super Bowl game in the States, you may be aware that there was a blackout. And immediately, our social media guy tweeted, wouldn't this be a good time to tune into Galton Abbey, which was broadcasting at the same time opposite the Super Bowl? <laughs> Everyone wrote about it. It was great. And you know what? Our audience went up for Downton Abbey. Uh, following our lead, many of our producers and different business units have really looked at uh, enlarging our presence on social media. We've been encouraged by the results of our forays. And in an analysis of how news outlets use Pinterest uh, to engage readers, they found that PBS has the highest repin to pin ratio, which is a great indicator of engagement. And we were honored to be named uh, one of the top five nonprofits using social media by Craig of Craigslist. Social media and the web in general have opened up new conversations among our viewers. Um, our recent documentary, Half the Sky, is a great example of how we've been able to use social media to inspire conversations about important issues. Half the Sky, Turning Oppression into Opportunity for Women Worldwide, focuses on women's rights around the globe in the hopes of empowering women. It's based on the book by Sherwood Dunn and Nicholas Kristof. And to encourage people to be a part of this movement, we placed promoted tweets and asked prominent people to tweet their support. On the day the first uh, part of Half the Sky premiered on PBS, hashtag Half the Sky trended in the United States. On the day the second part aired, the next day, the hashtag trended worldwide. Over the two nights of the broadcast, the size of the engaged audience was 66 million. Half generated almost 150,000 mentions and one billion impressions on Twitter. It's pretty powerful, given this is about an issue that's central to our human progress. Now, not everything we do in this new space is so serious. Thanks to new technology and social networks, people can create content and art in conversations with our work. We've worked hard to bring communities of shared interest together with events in real time so we can move online conversations into real interactions. Here's a clip from one such event around a project that I think some of you might recognize. There were 10,000 applicants 
for the several hundred seats that you lucky people are sitting in. We were all Carolina for 10 hours. So then you said 7 a.m. These fans outside are incredibly loyal, very savvy, very smart. If you woke up and you suddenly had those powers of super deduction, would that change your life? I'd like, I'd like to try it for a day without being <laughs> asked. Just run around town <laughs> and finding out shit about everybody. <laughs> I think what makes this show a huge hit, what, what, what distinguishes it from being something that people merely like to something they are incredibly excited and evangelical about is falling in love with the people in it. We believe in Sherlock and Watson! It's quite a responsibility to suddenly have this, this very, very passionate fan base and you sort of feel that you have to, to deliver to it. What have been your favorite scenes in the Sherlock series? I do love the scene in Buckingham Palace. Yes, <laughs> I love it. I like seeing the, the rear end of Sherlock and I like... <laughs> Oh, this is getting rather fun, isn't it? So it sort of makes sense that people who tweet and blog and respond fast on the internet, both to the program and to the characters in it, it makes sense that that sort of would spiral here. The on-screen chemistry between, like, Sherlock and John is, like, you know, the biggest thing on the internet right now. We're not a couple. <clears throat> it doesn't dumb itself down for anyone. It's just completely new and amazing, and I love the way they adapt the stories. It's a new era of audience, really. It's very exciting to be part of that. If Sherlock Holmes were watching television in, uh, in America, he'd be watching PBS. I wouldn't miss this for the world. Actually, um, part of the success of Downton Abbey in the States is not only because it's a great series that we happened to schedule on a night that we knew had an immediate audience, but I credit uh, a good bit of the excitement that was generated around Downton's social media. We watched the conversations that began at the beginning of season one that have just built through. Um, it is exciting to me to look at um, not only people organizing and talking online, but also organizing events where they get together and celebrate the series. Uh, but my favorite are the people that have created Twitter identities based on the characters. My favorite is Lady Mary's eyebrows. So if someone in the audience will tweet that out, she will tweet back to me. She is very happy when I talk about her wherever I go, at least I assume it's a her, wherever um, um, I travel. And I have to say, I think she would be thrilled to know that I was talking about her in Dublin. And so as we've used these new forms of community to help uh, reinvigorate our stations, we are encouraging them to also think about this space. You saw in one of the, in the Digital Studios clip that I showed, the uh, Barbecue with Franklin series, and some of you may have noted that that was funded through Kickstarter. So in addition to the fact that we are using this space as a way to develop content and share it out, we're also using uh, these various platforms as a way to also help us bring in resources. We're working with uh, dozens of stations, of our stations, to develop local reg web original programming and to ensure uh, through our national infrastructure that we can help support and promote their work. So we're actually bringing local stories to a national audience, and I would say uh, eventually an international audience. I won't say we're fully where we need to be, but I think our evolution is well underway, and we really have, I think, transformed from a uh, trans transition from a legacy television company to a truly multi-platform media organization. Uh, by going back to our core DNA and identifying our unique, unique strengths, we've been able to transform our work for kids, for adults, and for communities to truly educate, engage, and inspire our audiences. In the kids space, we've distinguished ourselves with content that really inspires kids to use the newest research and technology. We've expanded our work for adults on platforms, utilizing the strengths of both broadcast and web capabilities to engage new audiences and to provide a window on the world for as many Americans as possible. And we've redefined our work in communities to help inspire new conversations and connections in support of a stronger democracy. Now, 50 years ago, one of the giants of broadcasting in our country, Newton Minow, gave a very famous speech in which he decried the state of television as a vast wasteland. I think in the last 50 years, um, public media has in fact become an oasis in that wasteland. Uh, but when I think about Minow's most famous speech, ultimately it's not the comment he made about vast wasteland that made the biggest impression on me. In that same speech, he, he talks about a call to serve the public interest. A lifetime ago, he challenged broadcasters to put the people's airwaves 
to the service of the people and the cause of freedom. And half a century later, we work together in that service and that cause every hour of every day. We make that vision a reality for millions of people. Our work cannot be replaced or replicated by commercial outlets because we exist to serve the people and not sell to them. Our bottom line is the number of lives we touch, not the number of shareholders we enrich. And as the world continues its march forward, we have to continue to innovate so that we can continue to fulfill our unique mission. We have to collaborate across boundaries to keep public broadcasting vibrant and innovative and sound so it can serve the public and touch as many lives as possible. And I believe we have to come together as a global community, community to put the people's airwaves to the service of the people, to touch hearts and lift up minds, to nurture souls and spark curiosity, to educate and inspire. Of all the purveyors of media out there, public broadcasters are the only ones that are charged with this honorable mission. We are the only ones who can truly put the people's airwaves to the service of the people. I believe this is our time. And if we step forward together into the future and let the journey begin, there's certainly no time like the present. I'm gonna end with one last story. When I was doing a radio interview this afternoon, some of you may have heard it right before I came here, uh, with Matt Cooper, he seemed really surprised when I told him about this whole philanthropy idea of how public broadcasting in the States is funded. And I wanted to tell him a story which I didn't have the time to share because it was a short radio interview, but I'll share with you tonight. And I think it explains to you better than anything else, not only how we're funded, but how we're perceived in our country. A station manager in a, in a small station in upstate New York, in Rochester, New York, told me that one day he received a phone call from his front desk, and a man had come in that wanted to make a contribution. And rather than send his check through the mail, he had decided to deliver it in person. Station manager went down to see him. He was dressed in a baseball cap and a sweatshirt, and he handed him a check for $2,000. Station manager thanked him for making such a generous gift and asked him, by the way, what prompted you to make this contribution? He said, I recently lost my wife. And as she was dying, she said to me, I want you to do me a favor. I want you to take my wedding ring and sell it and give the money to WXXI, our local station. It has been so important to me, and I want to make sure that it's there for the future. So he went out and went to three different jewelry stores because he wanted to make sure that he got the very best gift best price for that gift. And he said to his daughter, because he was really uncertain, because this felt like such a tremendous thing to not give the ring to her and instead to sell it. And she said, that's what mom wanted. This was very important to her. I tell that story because it says a lot of things. One is it, it, it really talks about the bond that we have with people in our communities. That's actually how our stations around the country were formed. They were formed by people in communities that felt that television could be so much more than just entertainment, but that it had the potential to bring us together, to create forums for discussion, and that it could, in fact, enrich all of us. And we're only able to do that on an ongoing basis in our country because we have people that are willing to make, in some cases, what seem unbelievable gestures of hope and of love in making those kind of contributions. RTE is an amazing broadcaster. I look at the work and the breadth of the information that they are able to share through television and through radio. And I spent time with the digital team today. They are wrestling with all the same issues that we're wrestling with in the States. And for those that say, well, you know, the commercial marketplace, they could come in and they could solve all of it for you. I'll tell you, if when I tell you the programs that are on commercial television in my country that show up on cable channels that were established because they were going to be the commercial version of public broadcasting, I can tell you that Swamp People, which airs on American History Channel, has nothing to do with the kind of documentaries that Ken Burns produces that try to capture my country's cultural heritage. There is a difference if your objective is to return a profit to a shareholder, or if in fact you're trying to enrich a community. And that's what differentiates us all. I am so proud to be part of a global group of public broadcasters. I am very proud to work alongside of my colleagues here in Ireland, and I look forward to all the great work we can accomplish together. Thank you so very much for inviting me to be with you.